stay the same and uh, there, will, there, will not be, there will not be changes. Also for information, a commission of the Institut de Droit International is, um, has been studying the uh, implication of the principle of the equality of the parties, which is uh, in investment tribunals, which is an underlying principle for also all these issues of evidence before international uh, tribunals. The result of that, which is a very serious uh, study, will be ready by the end of this year and will be published by early next year in the annual of the Institute and also will be available on the site of the Institute. Uh, finally, and more uh, directly relevant, of course, is the proposal of the International Law Commission to the General uh, Assembly that was made uh, last year to put evidence on its uh, agenda thanks to the uh, effort and proposal of Dr. Uh, Rajput. And I hope that, that that's, an, that's an excellent idea that will be very helpful. There is lots of room for that. And I hope that that project will uh, take up soon under the uh, leadership of Dr. Rajput as uh, a special rapporteur. Now, uh, what I like to do as the, the discussed uh, among uh, the panelists here before, I like to do some, uh, try to highlight the general features of evidence in international procedure, which includes commercial arbitration and, uh, and exit. Uh, to, to, to start with, uh, this morning, uh, I think uh, uh, Judge uh, Klotkin said that when we uh, talk about alternative dispute settlements, we can go back to over 100 years, which is correct because we were told also that the PCIJ uh, started in 1922, and now we are getting close to that to, to 100 years. But at the same time, let's remember that when we talk about uh, um, criminal law or civil law, uh, we, we can go back to hundreds of years and sometimes to thousands of years for, for that. I mean, we can trace uh, uh, those, those laws uh, back, back to there. So in a way, international procedure is something new. And uh, yes, we talk about 100 years, but at the same time, these 100 years, maybe 50, 60, 70 years of it, there were not really much uh, activities. The, the, the two world courts were there, and then uh, some arbitration here and there uh, w w was there. The Human Rights Court uh, later came. We were here today, there is 60 years of experience and, and all that. The real thing, it seems to me, started from the 80s. From the, uh, lots of things has happened in the 80s and 90s, including the end of the Cold War and all that, and then some of the smaller things like um, uh, the start of the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, the start of uh, WTO, uh, ICSID existed since 1966, but it's really, when you see, when you look at those years before, they had one case a year. There are cases, there are years they didn't have any case at all. It's from 1990 that they start getting more cases and, and all that. Uh, so, in, uh, in 1935, a renowned uh, lawyer at the time, uh, Mr. Feller, uh, compared the procedure of international uh, tribunals to the Antarctica uh, uh, of international law in terms of complication and, and, and difficulties. Mr. Feller, uh, uh, he said that this in, his, in the introduction to his book of, uh, on uh, Mexican Claims Commission, uh, which, uh, by the way, I was very interested to see it is still on the Amazon cells from, from, uh, from uh, 1935. And, uh, and uh, it, is, it is that you cannot buy a new, but you can buy secondhand. They have uh, some people, some, some do that. And Mr. Feller became the first legal counsel of the UN. He was present in San Francisco, and then he continued for many years. He was the, he was the head of the legal department and, and all that. So he knew what he was talking about and he compared it to that. Now, since then and, and now, it, uh, it seems to me that there are still 
uh, progress to make. And, and, and there are, the issue is not really, we cannot say now it's free from problems and complications, but we can also say much progress has been made already in the development, codification, and harmonization in, of uh, international law in this, in this uh, respect. It exists as a result now a, ve a well-developed body of jurisprudence from the practice of numerous international courts and tribunals and various international rules of uh, procedure and uh, evidence. The system of international procedure in place while varying to some extent from one court to the, to the other uh, or one tribunal to the, to the other is harmonious. And we saw that today in the discussion as well, this uh, harmony, that uh, to, a, this is characterized, this system, by its flexibility, its freedom from the technical rules of evidence, and uh, by the freedom in evaluation of evidence in an effort to ascertain the truth. The general features are confirmed by reviewing the practice of these international tribunals, and in fact, by what we, what we saw today uh, during, the, during various, uh, various discussion. I was told I have two minutes, then on that case, uh, I allocate that, as you had said, to question or some question on maybe burden of proof and standard of uh, uh, proof. It was today, question of burden of proof has been, has been discussed. The, whoever uh, alleges a fact has to, has to prove, prove that. We discussed that there is probably it's better not to mention shifting because that is something related to the question of, uh, question of uh, burden of evidence. I think the source of that is that in some uh, common law countries, burden of proof also is used to mean burden of evidence as well, and that is why that, uh, that has come. I like to say that burden of proof rules is supplemented by two other rules. One is the question of uh, collaboration between the parties in international procedure, from which then it drives the question of uh, disclosure of documents, production of documents, whether negative inference, taking note, and all that could be, could be uh, drawn. And the other one is the authority of the tribunal in evaluation of uh, evidence and, uh, and deciding on the standard of proof. I, uh, I see also another sign. I had missed that. I didn't know there is also a sign. Uh, I, will, I will stop here. No Hopefully need for the goal. more time. Uh, maybe during the questions, I can add to some of the issues I wanted to mention. Of course. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Um, next, we have Roman Hadikin, who's a partner at Brian K. Leighton Paisner in London. Um, he in that capacity is a well-known litigator, an arbitration lawyer. He's also visiting professor at the Center for Commercial Law at Queen Mary University in London. He is going to deal with uh, rules of evidence, but in particular, adverse inferences. I would like also to thank you, everybody who remained here and uh, has not left. Uh, thank you. Very much appreciated. And with apology to my co-panelists, I'm going to speak in Russian. The topic of my presentation is about negative inferences having evidentiary significance. So, first, 
назад. Да, у нас небольшая проблема с техникой. Значит, первый слайд. Что такое негативные выводы? Негативные выводы – это ситуация, в которой сторона отказывается без уважительных причин раскрывать какой-либо документ. И на этом основании трибунал делает вывод, что этот документ, который незаконно или там необоснованно удерживается, этот документ опровергает позицию этой стороны. То есть это, по сути, инструмент, который дает право трибуналу посчитать факт установленным на основании того факта, что сторона просто отказалась раскрыть документ или предоставить истребуемое доказательство. Вот такой интересный инструмент. Этот инструмент известен российскому праву, но мне удалось найти только одну норму, которая э, э, таким образом работает. Это статья 79 арбитра... Гражданского процессуального кодекса, э, которая говорит, что при уклонении стороны от участия в экспертизе или непредставлении образцов, Суд вправе признать факт, для выявления которого экспертиза назначается, он, суд может считать такой факт установленным. Вот эта норма применяется в основном к одной категории дел в Российской Федерации, это дела об установлении отцовства. И я вам расскажу один пример из моего родного далекого сибирского города Иркутска, где у нас было дело в суде в местном по установлению отцовства, и предполагаемый отец ребенка очень яро отрицал какую-либо э, связь, тем более э, э, внебрачную, э, с женщиной, говорит, это не мой ребенок, э, и ему говорили, дай образец ДНК. Э, он отказывался давать этот образец ДНК, и судья ему пыталась объяснить. Она ему говорила, у нас есть норма, 79 ГПК, если ты не дашь ДНК, мы тебя все равно посчитаем отцом. И вот он упирался, говорил, нет, я не отец, но все равно образец не дал, и она, соответственно, выносит решение, признает его отцом, и спустя какое-то время она встречает его на улице и говорит, ну что же вы отрицали, ну почему вот, ну дали бы вы образец ДНК, если бы не вы отец. И он ей говорит, вы не понимаете, говорит, сейчас я жене своей говорю, что ты посмотри, какая у нас система правосудия, меня признали отцом, без всяких анализов ДНК, а если бы вы установили, что я отец, как бы я жил со своей женой в законном браке и в э, мире и согласии. Соответственно, э, таким образом не всегда юридические значит, моменты каким-то образом э, здесь влияют. Но тем не менее, такая норма есть. В, в, в АПК такой нормы нет, но э, были разъяснения, что эта норма должна применяться в аналогии. И по сути сейчас идет большая, не такая, не очень большая, но дискуссия некая, что это за природа этой нормы, является это санкцией или является ли это презумпцией. Но тем не менее, вот чтобы вы поняли, что такое негативные выводы, о которых я собираюсь говорить, это вот в российском праве статья 79.3, что важно, что ее часто осторжествляют, например, с нормами АПК, которые говорят, что если сторона не оспаривает факт, то этот факт считается там доказанным. Это норма 79.3, она о другом. Потому что когда у нас это, в, в данном случае факт оспаривается, он оспаривается стороной, и тем не менее на основании поведения стороны делается вывод, имеющий доказательное значение. В то время как э, в ситуации с признанием факта, он может быть признание может быть прямым, оно может быть э, молчаливым, но это все равно признание факта, это не оспаривание факта. То есть в данном случае это презумпция, негативные выводы, они э, опровергают э, доводы другой стороны. Теперь идем дальше. Значит, э, э, негативные выводы, почему вообще, как бы на каком основании трибунал может их делать? Есть тому логическое объяснение, логическое обоснование. Оно заключается в том, что э, если сторона необоснованно отказывается раскрывать доказательства, то разумно предположить, что это доказательство ей э, э, против нее. Соответственно, э, более того, трибунал исходит еще более из презумпции, что Сторона раскрыла все имеющиеся у нее доказательства, которые поддерживают ее позицию. Поэтому, соответственно, вот эти две презумпции, они являются обоснованием самой концепции негативных выводов, на которой все, вся вот эта концепция зиждется. Далее, у государственных в чем разница? Почему арбитражи так часто используют? Дело в том, что есть разница между государственными судами и между трибуналами. И разница в основная, основная в том, что у государственных судов есть аппарат принуждения. Они могут, суд может вынести определение об истребовании доказательства, выдать исполнительный лист, дать его приставу, пристав прибежит. Если не исполняют, у них вплоть до того, что есть уголовная ответственность за, за злостное неисполнение судебного акта. Так вот, арбитрам, арбитрам такие полномочия не предоставлены. То есть вот у них есть при Приказ. Да, есть процедура, через которую либо трибунал, либо сторона может обращаться к государственному суду за, э, э, государственному суду за э, содействием, 
Но тем не менее, это все-таки разные процедуры. Да? То есть у, у, у трибунала нет полномочий государственного принуждения. И поскольку у них нет полномочий государственного принуждения, соответственно, им ничего не остается, им надо как-то восполнять пробелы в доказательной базе. И эти пробелы они чаще восполняют при помощи негативных э, выводов, которые они делают. Дальше. Применимое положение. Самое детальное положение о негативных выводах содержится в правилах Международной ассоциации юристов о получении доказательств в международном арбитраже. И им там посвящены две нормы. Это статья 9.5 и 9.6. Они в принципе об одном с одним исключением. 9.5 это о, о непредставлении раскрытии документа. 9.6 о непредставлении иных видов доказательств, будь то свидетельские показания, заключение экспертов и так далее. Но и то, и другое, и та, и другая, говорит, вот 9.5 я здесь привожу. Если без при, приемлемых об, объяснений сторона не представляет какой-либо документ, запрошенный в ходатайстве о представлении документов, в отношении которого она своевременно не возражала или он был истребован составом арбитража, то состав арбитража вправо, вправе сделать вывод о том, что такой документ был бы неблагоприятен для интересов этой стороны. Теперь я вам нарисовал радужную картину, что есть некий инструмент, инструмент негативных выводов, прекрасный инструмент для восполнения пробелов, но не всегда им удается воспользоваться, и я хочу рассказать как раз о тех сложностях, с которых арбитры сталкиваются при негативных выводах. Первое. Отказ, возвращаясь к времени доказывания, отказ предоставить доказательства, да, это процессуальное нарушение, но он не переносит время доказывания. Время доказывания, как было на ИСЦ, вам ответчик не раскрыл, все равно оно осталось на ИСЦ. И этот негативный вывод, они должны, он должен соответствовать иным доказательствам по делу. То есть если нет других доказательств, у вас есть только вот один факт и не представил доказательства, если нет иных доказательств, то этого недостаточно, чтобы посчитать факт установленным. У меня были, вот недавно я был арбитром в деле, как раз где была ситуация, что у стороны не было никаких других доказательств, только негативные выводы они просили сделать. И мы как арбитраж посчитали, что мы не можем этого сделать, просто потому что негативные выводы должны подкрепляться какими-то другими доказательствами по делу. Не обязательно прямыми, но должны быть какие-то другие доказательства по делу. Далее. Второй момент сложный, что очень нелегко определить, какой конкретно вывод можно сделать. Хорошо, мы поняли, сторона уклоняется, мы поняли, что скорее всего что-то есть в этом документе такое, что эта сторона не хочет трибунал видеть. Но что конкретно? И я привожу вам два примера. Первое. Сторона отказалась представлять протокол внутреннего обсуждения, где вероятно обсуждался долг и ссу. Естественно, говорит мне, Давайте сделаем негативный вывод, что они признали долг. Хорошо. А можно ли сделать вывод, что он признал долг полностью, или он признал его в части, или вообще он признал этот долг? Да, они обсуждали его, ну то есть, скорее всего, были, он отказался представлять протокол Совета директоров. А если они обсуждали в части или полностью, может быть, были какие-то там презумпции, то есть мы этого не знаем, и такой вывод сделать достаточно сложно. Или второй пример. Сторона заявляет, что сделки с заинтересованностью не повлекли убытки для компании. То есть, естественно, пытается взыскать убытки, а ответчик говорит, нет, 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 это, это была сделка в интересах компании, никаких убытков не повлекло, но доказательств не раскрывает. Скорее всего, из этого факта мы как арбитры или там арбитры, которым, перед которым мы выступаем, смогут сделать вывод, что эта сделка не была в интересах компании. Но это там, где наш негативный вывод заканчивается, потому что мы не можем сказать, насколько она была убыточной для компании. Мы не можем рассчитать размер убытков, мы не можем посчитать какие-то иные факторы, которые важны. Далее. А. Ну, я на самом деле сделал на двух языках все, чтобы… Да, хорошо. Далее, следующий момент… Я хотел вам привести два дела, проиллюстрировать на примере двух дел. Значит, первое дело это так называемый нафтоарбитраж. Нафта это соглашение, североамериканское соглашение о свободной торговле. И это было требование против Мексики. Соответственно, истец заявлял, что Мексика необоснованно отказалась представлять ИСУ налоговый вычет. В то, в то время как такой же вычет представлялся, это было дело, которое касалось дистрибьюции сигарет, значит, такой же налоговый вычет представлялся мексиканским компаниям. И Мексика отказалась представить доказательства. И состав арбитров большинством голосов принял это и сделал негативные выводы. Обратите внимание, что он сказал. Он сказал, что 
а их отец установил презумпцию и представил доказательства прайма фейши, что отношение к ИСТУ было иным и менее благоприятным, чем к мексиканским продавцам сигарет. А ответчик не представил достоверных доказательств, чтобы эту презумпцию опровергнуть. То есть здесь, соответственно, негативный вывод сделан. И один из арбитров сделал, соответственно, один из арбитров вынес, написал особое мнение. Особое мнение было в следующем. Для того, чтобы подтвердить, что государство систематически нарушает свое собственное право для предоставления менее благоприятного режима инвесторам или для любой иной цели, необходимы доказательства, которые бы прямо подтверждали эти факты. Я придерживаюсь мнения, пишет арбитр, который остался в меньшинстве, что, такие, что для доказывания этого факта негативные выводы были недостаточны, что нужны иные факты. И если бы такая модель поведения существовала, то, скорее всего, она бы как-то проявлялась, были бы какие-то ее проявления. Вот. И второе дело, на которое я хотел вам сослаться, это дело, которое рассматривал Иран US Tribunal, так называемые это споры американских инвесторов с Ираном. Там тоже ситуация, это, кстати, один из тех трибуналов, которые часто выносят негативные выводы, то есть такой достаточно. Но здесь тоже было дело, где было большое решение большинства и в то же время было особое мнение. Значит, суть дела в чем? Истица не могла доказать право собственности на 510 акций на предъявителя в компании Хошкев. И эта компания занималась торговлей сталью. Она просила трибунал сделать негативные выводы. Из чего? Потому что два раза Ирану приказали раскрыть реестр акционеров и э, протокол совета директоров, и оба раза Иран отказался это сделать. И она говорит, что, соответственно, если они это бы сделали, то там скорее почему они не делают. Значит, там подтверждается, что у меня 510 этих акций есть. Там немного, немножко было сложнее в том, что э, она эти акции получила от мужа перед его смертью, и нужно было доказать, что в какой момент она приобрела право собственности на эти акции. Но это не столь важно. Так вот, что решил трибунал большинством? Он сказал, что касается, отказал в негативных выводах и сказал, что касается заявления истицы о том, что трибунал должен был сделать негативные выводы из факта непредставления реестра акционеров, трибунал отмечает, что спорные 510 акций являются акциями на предъявителя. И что по иранскому праву не требуется внесение записи о переходе прав на такие акции в реестр акционеров. И в дополнение статья 10 устава этой компании также предусматривает, что переход прав на именные акции не требует одобрения совета директоров или внесения в реестр. То есть на этом основании они сказали, что мы вам не, не делаем негативные выводы, потому что по сути он сказал, они не соответствуют иранскому праву, что по иранскому праву не было необходимости, и значит мы не можем сделать вывод, что реестр бы подтвердил ваше право собственности на акции. И здесь тоже было особое мнение, особое мнение судьи американского в отставке, который написал следующее. Он написал, что решение произвольно лишает истца какой-либо возможности разрешить это экстраординарное время доказывания. Правда, трибунал приказал ответчику не один раз, а дважды за пять лет дослушания раскрыть, помимо прочего, реестры акционеров, другие связанные документы во всех шести компаниях, которые были экспроприированы и в которых по заявлению истицы у нее были доли. Ответчик никогда не отрицал, что такие документы имеются. Более того, на какие-то части этих документов они ссылались. Вот. И очевидно, что истица, хотя и не смогла, обоснов... не смогла обосновать свои требования прайма фейши, она, не... она смогла обосновать прайма фейши, не могла доказать их вне всяких сомнений. И в этом случае арбитр в меньшинстве посчитал, что нужно было такие выводы делать. Что я хочу сказать в заключении, что механизм этот есть, он работает, связан с определенными сложностями, поэтому арбитрам часто бывает сложно обосновать свои негативные выводы, доказать, что они соответствуют другим доказательствам по делу, но о чем пишут все другие комментаторы, что так или иначе негативные выводы арбитры делают, даже если об этом прямо не пишут в своем решении. Спасибо. Yes, I uh, didn't manage to replace my microphone. Um, about the headphones, I had thought that this room full of lawyers was a good neighborhood, but um, uh, apparently a questionable one. Um, 
Our next speaker is Dr. Naila Komair Obeid, who is founding partner at the Obeid Law Firm in Beirut. She's also a professor at the Lebanese University. So now she is also um, both an arbitrator and an academic. She's heavily involved with commercial and investor state arbitration. And last year, she was president of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Nyla is going to address the differences between the common law and civil law approaches to evidence, but perhaps more constructively, the way that they are combined in investment arbitration. Thank you, Nyla. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed an honor for me to participate in the last session of this very well thought out event on evidence before international courts and tribunals. I would like to thank Judge Roman Kolodskin for his invitation. I would like also to thank the Center for International and Comparative Law Research for their dedication and their effort in organizing such an outstanding and successful event. I'm very pleased to be in Moscow, which I'm visi visiting for the first time. Moscow is a fascinating city, and its arbitration landscape has been constantly blooming over the last years, which make me very pleased to participate in this timely today's discussion. Uh, I will focus my presentation on the differences between common law and civil law approaches to evidence and their coexistence in international commercial and investment arbitration. Thus, I would like to tackle firstly, very briefly, the main characteristic of common law and civil law systems with regard to evidence, and then I will address the way the two systems have merged in the international world thus forming a hybrid, yet very efficient system. I would like to disclose that uh, as a uh, immediate past president of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators uh, last year, uh, it was uh, uh, among the program uh, that I did during my presidency is to discuss the synergy and diversions between common law and civil law. Because in fact, they are divergent, however, synergy is very important. And while I am sitting in international tribunals, either commercial or investment arbitration, I'm always uh, facing this problematic and some problematic uh, uh, based on this divergence between the two legal cultures. That's why I would like then uh, in addressing the uh, characteristic of the two system, I will start uh, by the common law system. Uh, in the common law accusatory tradition, it's an accusatory tradition, the judge remains largely passive, as you know, leaving the active case management to the parties. As a result, the evidential process is party driven. That is, the disputing parties decide what fact and expert witness evidence they wish to serve in support of their respective case and are in charge of interrogating the witnesses and experts they call. Because the parties are the masters of the evidentiary process, common law practitioners have historically viewed a broad party-initiated disclosure process as an inevitable feature of dispute resolution and are often reluctant to meaningfully limit either party the use of that right. The golden rule in document disclosure in common law is the proverbial, is the proverbial cards face up the table in order to secure the equality of arm and in search of an absolute truth. Further, the common law, uh, the common lawyer heavily relies upon oral testimony, as you may know. As such, common law practitioners will typically master very well the art of cross-examination of witnesses and experts whose oral testimonies will form an important part of the evidentiary record. Civil law tradition, practitioners have a different conception 
of the way the procedure should be conducted. The inquisitorial approach underlying the civil law draws on the Roman adage of Jura Nuvit Curia, the court knows the law, whereby the judge takes an active role in the fact-finding process and the judge is responsible of establishing the truth. I will quote uh, Professor Pierre Testi uh, in a lecture at the American University Washington College of Law. Professor Testi stated, justice is not dispensed in the same way everywhere around the globe, meaning that the preferred way of applying the law in one legal system can be inconceivable in another legal system. As a result, the general approach in most civil law arbitration legislation uh, is, for example, uh, regarding discovery, uh, is not properly addressed in the law of the civil law countries. I can give the example of, for example, the, Swift, the Swiss law on private international law is, is silent on, in matters of uh, disclosure. Uh, similarly, uh, German and Swedish Arbitration Act, for example. Uh, so how we have to bridge the gap between these two approaches? In fact, in international arbitration, in commercial and investment arbitration, uh, the two systems have merged uh, and with respect to the assessment of evidence in international commercial and investment arbitration. In order to ensure predictability, the predictability of the process, which is the most important feature in international arbitration, in my view. I would like you to tackle two examples uh, because of the time constraint. The first one in relation to disclosure or production of document, and then the other one with respect to oral testimony and uh, uh, namely expert evidence in international commercial and investment arbitration. Firstly, concerning the disclosure in international arbitration, this is the privacy versus transparency. Uh, the extent of a legal system that which uh, uh, would like to give is uh, to strike the right balance between the competing needs of protecting the party's privacy and the will to promote transparency. The need for transparency in arbitration has led a number of arbitration practitioners, practitioners including from civil law background, to be in favor of disclosure. While, as you know, the arbitral tribunal's power to order disclosure is ultimately defined by the procedural law of the arbitration, the law of the seat or lex arbitri, which provides the legal basis and framework for the arbitrator's disclosure authority and the limits on such authority. The procedure rules chosen by the parties generally give more detailed information about the way evidence should be gathered. The procedure rules, for example, produced by arbitral institutions are marked, are marked by the conversions of adversarial and inquisitorial techniques in the presentation of documentary evidence to facilitate a harmonized approach to document production in international disputes. For example, the IBA rules of evidence have been designated as a procedural compromise solution between the common and civil law world in the, in the presentation of evidence in international arbitration proceedings. In practice, the IBA rules have introduced the practical framework for the advancement of requests for, for, produ for production of document in an international arbitration process involving the parties from varying cultural and legal background. Another example, the Redfern schedule, assists in the articulation and determination of document production requests under the IBA rules of evidence and as such facilitates 
an understanding of how document production under the IBA rules works in practice. Similarly, the 2010 Yun Citra rules, and for example, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center rules, for instance, also confirm the arbitral tribunal's disclosure authority. The uh, International Chamber of Commerce rules in Paris, on the, on the other hand, do not expressly provide for requests by the parties for disclosure, but it is clear that an ICC tribunal's authority extends to permitting the parties to make requests for, for disclosure from their counterparties upon which the tribunal may base its disclosure order. There is now an emerging consensus among experienced arbitrators and practitioners that a measure of document disclosure is desirable in most international disputes. Thus, justice is almost always best served by a degree, by a degree of transparency which brings the relevant facts before the arbitrators. Justice, as well as efficiency, is also best served by ensuring disclosure of the re relevant facts sufficiently in advance of the witness hearing that the parties can prepare and present their case in light of these facts. In practice, arbitral tribunal, and this is my practice, usually considers that for document production to be efficient, it must serve the purpose of bringing to the arbitral tribunal's knowledge not just any documents relevant and material to the outcome of the dispute, but documentary evidence without which a party would not be able to discharge the burden of proof lying upon it. Accordingly, the parties could not request the production of documents only to prove the inaccuracy of statement made by the other party. Instead, their request for document production had to be limited to documents helping them in discharging their burden of proof. Moreover, when a document production request is disputed, the arbitral tribunal will consider whether prima facie the requesting party actually needs the document to discharge its burden of proof. The second example I would like to address is the oral testimony with an emphasis uh, in expert evidence. Uh, uh, I will skip uh, some uh, passages of my speech and I will tackle pa the practical perspective with respect to expert evidence. In practical, and this is my practice, uh, it is very advisable that tribunals play an active role to request the parties at an early stage after the first round of submission and when they have a better understanding of the issues to be determined, uh, to request the parties to submit a common list of expert disciplines with the methodology the expert would like to rely on in the relevant discipline, as well as a list of common issues to be addressed. Um, I would like uh, here to discuss very quickly uh, the difficulties uh, uh, regarding party appointed experts uh, and when there are a conflicting views between, uh, between the, uh, the experts. Uh, the problem um, uh, is uh, really um, um, very, very uh, uh, problematic uh, when experts uh, defers their opinion regarding, for example, level of damages appropriate due to a breach of certain clauses, for example, in, the, in a construction dispute, or that certain values are more appropriate, for example, in an expropriation claim. A further problem is where party appointed experts uh, divide on theoretical lines, and, uh, for example, accounting experts may have a fundamentally different views as to the best way to value a company or business. A tribunal will have difficulties in deciding which theoretical view to accept if both theories 
are well, ex are, are well respected in the relevant professional circles. Uh, these are mainly the challenges faced by tribunals when receiving expert evidence. What are very briefly the solutions? Uh, the solution could be the hot, the hot topping is a potential solution. Uh, the process of hot topping, as you know, involves experts convening at an, initial, at an initial stage of a matter in order to define the issues and points of fact in dispute. Uh, the technique uh, would be very efficient if the tribunals are very well prepared. It takes time, uh, but generally it's very efficient, but we have really, and uh, namely the president, uh, should really prepare carefully hot toppings. The other solution is uh, a, uh, a single appointed tribunal expert could be a solution. Um, and I would like really uh, briefly to uh, inform you about the SACS protocols. Uh, uh, this is a protocol uh, initiated, proposed by Klaus Sachs, where he suggested that the arbitral tribunal selects um, uh, tribunal appointed expert rather than party appointed experts an expert team comprised of fund experts from each list put forward by the opposing parties. The member of any expert team, like any tribunal appointed expert, have duty of independence and impartiality and be responsible to the tribunal. Uh, yeah. 30 seconds. Yeah, uh, the particularities in investment state arbitration. Uh, uh, in fact, the rule procedures and practice of document production and oral testimony in investment arbitration largely mirror those found in commercial arbitration. However, there are some specific issues that I, do, I would like to mention. Evidentiary privilege, because we have a state, um, and uh, uh, namely, um, uh, when there is information uh, related to a secret diplomatic negotiations, state secret, deliberative process privilege, uh, confidential taxpayer record, and uh, secrecy of law enforcement investigation. Other, other also uh, uh, um, difficulties when you have a, a revolution or an uh, unrest in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in in the part of our world, for example, when you have crisis, the difficulties is to gather evidence, namely for the state. Uh, investors are better in gathering evidence than for a state. In conclusion, in conclusion, we need to be really innovative and we need to be creative. And we would like really to, uh, uh, to have a predictability of our system. Otherwise, uh, it's, 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 it's really a problem. We need to have confidence in the system, and uh, the only possibility is uh, to have uh, a, a rule, universal, for example, or transnational rules of evidence to be applied everywhere, and like that we will have similar approach uh, despite having a different fora. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Nyla. Um, finally, we have Dr. Rainer Martins, who heads his own law firm and is a specialist in sports law. He is the inventor of the basketball arbitration tribunal. Uh, you can imagine uh, from his height that he also um, plays basketball. And we're honored because he's missing basketball this evening in order to be with us which is why I'm keen to give him his full time. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Michael. Thank you, uh, the organizers, for making this possible. Um, the uh, topic of today is evidence in sports arbitration. What I would like to cover briefly will be with you to um, give you the, the background of what sports arbitration is all about. Then the Court of Arbitration for Sport, because the title should actually be Evidence Before CAS, because CAS 
for very specific reasons has a monopoly in sports arbitration. And at the end, I will briefly uh, cover the arbitral, uh, basketball arbitral tribunal. Um, as regards, why, why, what is so special about sports? Why do we have to why do we have to deal with sports arbitration separately from every, everybody else? Sports is a worldwide phenomenon. It's exercised throughout the world. And um, uh, it, it's supposed to be operating under the identical rules. Playing rules are identical, almost. In basketball, the NBA plays under slightly different rules than the world basketball. And um, it should be operating under the same legal framework. Um, it does to a certain extent. And the, um, uh, the, the, the reason why I'm saying here that uh, the, the CAS, the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne, is a quasi-monopolist is for the simple reason that there is a network of rules and regulations on the top of which is the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, that mandates everybody that's in the family, mandates everybody that is in the family to accept jurisdiction by the Court of Arbitration for Sport. There's a recent development where uh, private organizers um, uh, run events with top athletes outside of the pyramid on the top of which is the IOC, and it remains to be seen whether this monopolistic structure of sport will survive. For the time being, it is a monopoly. Everybody, if you are an athlete, a professional athlete, and to a very large extent even an amateur athlete, Am I? Well, they are all subject to the same rules, and if there's a dispute, it comes to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. CAS has been challenged recently, um, uh, fairly aggressively, before the court systems, first in Germany by a German athlete called Claudia Pechstein. The case was uh, uh, ultimately decided by the German um, uh, highest civil court, the Bundesgerichtshof, and Frau Pechstein lost. I admit that I was on the other side. I was on the side of the, of the Federation. And uh, the, the uh, Human Rights uh, Court in Strasbourg has dealt with the question that is at the core of the problem, that is, is the CAS an independent court of arbitration? Why is that uh, question being asked? Because um, there are two players in the family that contribute more than 50% of the budget, and that's the IOC and the Olympic family, that is the international federations, on the one hand, and football in particular, that contributes to more than 50% of the cases that end up before this court. Um, jury is still out. The, uh, the uh, Strasbourg court has decided that the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne is an independent court of arbitration with two dissenting opinions which are worth reading. That's all I say because I've been a member, I've been a member of this court for 32 years, so um, I'm somewhat biased. Um, the main features of this court, which you should understand, is it's a closed list of arbitrators. It has probably close to 300 arbitrators from about 100 countries. Um, it has two divisions. One is the ordinary division, which deals with cases which, for example, a television company and a federation enter into a media contract, and they decide to choose, because they, they have the liberty of doing what they want, choose uh, dispute resolution by CAS. And the other division is the so-called appeals division, and the most notorious aspect of this is obviously the doping cases. Um, the a crucial element is uh, in also in the difference between those two divisions is the appointment of the arbitrators and the chairperson. Uh, in the ordinary division, the two parties appoint their arbitrator from the closed list, and the two arbitrators appoint their chairperson. 
uh, if they fail to do that, then someone else steps in. In the, um, um, in the appeals division, the chair, both parties appoint an arbitrator and the chairperson is appointed by the court. That's a reason of criticism because people say, well, this court is dominated, and I'm not going to go into details, this court is dominated by the sports movement, the sports administration, and they appoint the chairperson. So that is an issue. What can you do about this? Um, it, it's been mentioned that there should be an international court for investment disputes. The only solution is this, because who's going to pay the millions of euros that this court spends every year? If it, the parties will not. The athletes, the athletes do not contribute significantly to the cost of the court. It's free of, basically free of charge. So this is the... Uh, this is the basic framework. Now, rules of evidence. Um, uh, I have decided to um, uh, just skip a major portion of what I was going to explain to you because um, uh, it's, those are details of Swiss law which I don't need to bother you with. Um, I wanted to bother you with the, um, uh, with the bottom line. The bottom line is, uh, no surprise, the bottom line is that the, uh, the parties are free to choose the rules of, um, uh, of evidence between them. And if they do not, then the, uh, the arbitration court has the uh, flexibility to decide how they want to deal with it. And uh, that's the end of the story. Now, um, the, um, uh, the parties for forced arbitration, I explained to you, Forced arbitration means you have to accept this book. You have chosen this book, which are, is the code of uh, sports-related arbitration. Um, whether voluntarily or not, that's been an issue as well, obviously. Um, now, um, uh, so you're, you're, you're um, um, expected to have chosen this book. Uh, this book gives you very limited guidance on evidence. What the arbitrators usually do is they look to the IBA rules. Now, I cannot resist making a few comments on civil law and common law. Uh, I will give you the examples. There's no, there's no specific rule. The, the example is Case one, a panel with a chairperson from uh, the United States and two arbitrators from Switzerland and Germany. The, the way the case involves is as follows. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the CAS um, introduction of the panel. Um, uh, uh, you have brought some evidence. You have brought your witnesses. Uh, the floor is yours. Party says, okay, did you, did you write this witness statement? Yes. Okay. Do you confirm what's in there? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Other side. <laughs> what do you have to say? Oh, well, he, this has been a lie and cross-examination, which in my view produces very little. Okay. That's issue number one. <laughs> issue number two is... The chairperson is a, let me, let me say, a German, okay? <laughs> Two months before the hearing, he writes to the parties and says, the panel is interested to hear from you on the following subjects. And he gives a list of 12 items. I did this very recently. And then in the hearing, he will say, you are a witness. Let me ask you the following questions. And then you go ahead and you ask the questions that you're interested in. And then, do you have, does any of the parties have supplemental questions to be asked? Yes or no. I'm biased. The latter part is what happens before a German court. Now, there is a, this is not only a technical difference. Let's face it ladies and gentlemen, it is 
a substantive difference between the two, and the result may be different. What's the solution to this? I just realized when uh, I was listening to one of the presentations today um, uh, that we have a theoretical answer because the IBA rules say the following. The arbitral tribunal is encouraged to identify to the parties as soon as it considered it to be appropriate any issues that the tribunal may regard as relevant to the case and material to its outcome. Here you go. That's exactly what should happen in my view. But it's not being followed. I had a case where I was chairing an English and an American co-arbitrator. I said, listen, friends, you know what I'm proposing to do? I will introduce the subject. I will take 10, 15 minutes to introduce the subject matter of this case. I will explain what this is all about and what the tribunal is interested in. I'm sure you have both studied very carefully the file in advance of the hearing, obviously, because everybody has to do that. And then they said, no, Reiner, you cannot do this. No, 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 you cannot do this. It's impossible. You have to, you know, you have to say good morning and then the floor is yours. That's what you have to say, which gives an incentive to the lazy arbitrators to say, I'm not studying the file. I'm, I'm registering 15 hours preparation of the, of the case and then I come because it will be presented to me and then I can still, in the, the deliberation room, get my, the, the necessary information. That's the issue. And uh, what effect, other than the effect of uh, um, um, saving time and cost, the outcome may be different. And that is a fact. Uh, two minutes here, two minutes there. There is a, there, there. <laughs> so that makes it four, that makes it four. That makes it four. Okay. Uh, the, uh, very quickly, um, what are the rules of evidence before CAS? The burden of proof normal, like in Swiss law, the party that relies on a fact has to prove it. That's the, uh, that's the normal rule. Special circumstances in doping cases, um, some of you may be familiar with this. The, the violation of the rules is the presence of a prohibited substance in the body of an athlete. The presence, no fault, nothing. Just the presence in your body while you're competing is a violation. So it's on the athlete to prove that it wasn't my fault. That's, that's a special rule, but there's no alternative to this because it, after all, it's in your body. You know what you did. Um, the, um, the, the standard of proof is um, the um, comfortable satisfaction of the panel, bearing in mind the seriousness of the accusation. Don't ask me what the difference is. It is anywhere in between the balance of probability and the um, overwhelming, you know, the criminal standard. Um, do I pay a lot of attention to this when I'm an arbitrator? I'm, I was involved in close to 200 cases. No. Do I believe him or not? And if it, is it sufficient or not what has been presented to me? And we had a recent case where the tribunal said, I believe there is something wrong with this, but I need the evidence and the evidence is simply not sufficient. Um, no discovery rules. There are no special rules in discovery. There is a rule in the code that says the, the court, the panel, has the power to say, I want this party to present the following documents, provided that, the, uh, that I believe that the, the uh, document exists and that the other part is in possession and it's relevant. Um, the, um, do, does, does CAS pay more attention to documentary evidence? Uh, that, that's the, that, those are the two minutes that are left for me. The, I, the, you know, please very stick, good. stick to the, the, that's the agreement. Thank you very much. Um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the documentary evidence depends on the panel. 
the, 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 if it's a civil law panel, they will, the, the witnesses, come on, witnesses can be influenced, to put it very, 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 very conservatively. They can be influenced. Of course, they're lying. I had a case where the, the, I know that the witness lied to me because, but he was from Belarus. And, 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 and I said, I want, to, I want to have the witness in front of me with a, uh, an interpreter. But unfortunately, under the rules of CAS, the uh, parties bring the interpreter. And I'm, sh I'm positive that the interpreter lied to me. He said the sun is out and whatever, uh, because they had prearranged the statements. Um, I will skip the rest and just give you a very, very brief um, a comment on the court of arbitration for, um, no, no. <laughs> the basketball arbitral tribunal that was created by my firm uh, for the solution of disputes between professional basketball players and their clubs. And um, uh, what's special about this court, it's quick, it's extremely quick, it's quicker than the CAS, no question about it. Therefore, because it's quicker, it's less expensive. And thirdly, um, the, uh, the rule has been mentioned several times today, Jura uh, Novi Curia, and in this case, uh, Curia doesn't know the law, and this is <laughs> why, because the court decides ex equo et bono, uh, which adds to the speed of the process. No applicable national laws, it just decides ex equo et bono on the basis of uh, equity and fairness. Thank you very much. Well, I promised Rainer his full time, and I hope you're all impressed at my very objective timekeeping, sticking to that promise, even during all of those insults to the common law. I was <laughs> sorely tempted. Um, however, um, we have time, I think, for some questions, if there are any questions from the audience. Over there, on the right-hand side. Thank you very much. I'm Mikhail Kalinin from Norton Rose Fulbright. I have a question to Raman. And you mentioned the obvious limitation of the adverse inst uh, inference institution, uh, which does not allow you to determine the quantum. So I'm wondering what is your approach to that? Let's say a claimant has a claim of a billion dollars. Respondent does not produce any evidence but it says the maximum is 10 million. What should the tribunal do? I think first it's not for the tribunal, it's for the parties to help tribunal to, uh, uh, to establish quantum. And that, I, I, if I were a party in this case, I would try to find other evidence, even if indirect, to uh, corroborate the evidence. So that would be, I mean, the adverse inferences in that case would have helped me to establish that it, it's, it's not beneficial for the company, A. Eh? But then you have accounts, you have, uh, and nowadays uh, accountants can give you uh, a caveated opinions, say, you know, with some assumptions. And so, so it's a matter, uh, it's, uh, unfortunately it's case, case specific. But what I find that uh, nowadays it's more uh, dependent on uh, you, on counsel, how you present evidence. Because in some instances, there's so, m so much information nowadays out there. Uh, we had recently a case where um, uh, the other side uh, uh, effectively denied that uh, they sent an email. So we went to a forensic expert who gave us date and time and location where and, and device used from which this, uh, and he said it was in Swiss Alps, in that particular place in Swiss Alps, uh, iPad was used to send this email. Then we went on Facebook, found this guy and a picture of him and his wife sitting in, French, uh, in, in Swiss Alps with signpost behind him. So and this too kind of corroborated. So it's it, it kind of nowadays there are a lot of information but you need to bring it to the table. And uh, to, to, to allow to uh, then, that, then in that case, tribunal often decides uh, on which par uh, which party bears the uh, uh, onus, the burden of proof. Uh, uh, in many cases, and kind of that that actually uh, uh, takes us to another question because uh, I think the burden of proof, the classical burden of proof, 
is more robustly applied by Russian courts than by international tribunals. I mean, I would welcome your views, but what I've seen, for instance, in, in international tribunals, if the respondent, uh, um, uh, it, it, the claimant, for instance, fails to prove the, the quantum, and the tribunal would still try to find a way to award something, while there are plenty of examples in Russia where they say you are represented by, the, the judge will say, you are represented by professional counsel, uh, you fail to prove the quantum, I give you zero damages. Really sorry, it's kind of, sue your attorney, do whatever you want. And the Yukas case is one example where effectively Russia played this very card. Russia did not produce positive evidence. What they did, they produced expert, uh, expert, expert who question the uh, evidence of the claimant, uh, but they haven't given another figure to the tribunal. The tribunal found that um, uh, the claimant's expert uh, uh, is not reliable. He actually broke into tears during cross-examination and confirmed a, a reverse engineering. So they said it's not reliable evidence, but because the respondent hasn't produced any evidence, we need to find a way to award something. That's what kind of was the, uh, so I think in, in, in Russia it's applied more robustly Russian judges would normally dismiss such a case. The same happens in England. Um, I remember a case where the claimant's expert also collapsed. The judge was keen to give some damages and wanted to ask questions of my expert, but I managed to send my expert on holiday uh, to <laughs> Scotland, in fact. So unfortunately, he wasn't available. We then explained that this was an adversarial process and the judge was rather rude in the judgment, but gave no damages. Oh, okay. so. yeah, that, that's an example. And uh, can I also comment on the sport arbitration? One, one interesting. Uh, have you been involved in the Gasgate case? Uh, just you know, before I proceed any further. The case. Yeah, the case. Uh, it's an absolutely <laughs> fantastic case where uh, a prohibited substance, namely cocaine, was found in the blood of a tennis player, Gasgate, and uh, he managed to sell to the tribunal the idea that uh, he went to a nightclub, met a girl there whose name was Pamela, kissed her, and that's how cocaine was put into his system. He said, I've never, I've, I'd never met her before, I'd never met her afterwards, but that's effectively how it worked. And uh, that's a matter of evidence, again, kind of how, because there have, have been many cases where uh, people were trying very hard to sell any idea to the tribunal that they were innocent in kind of uh, uh, getting these uh, prohibited substances in their, in their systems. But only Gasket uh, was successful in such a remarkable way. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I briefly explain a little bit, there's, there's a little bit more of detail. Uh, he met the girl in a completely innocent restaurant completely innocent, Italian restaurant, he met the girl. Then they proceeded because he had withdrawn from the tournament because he had an injury and the doctor told him don't play. So he, he, they went on to uh, partying and went to a more suspicious place. <laughs> but the girl he had met in the innocent place and they started kissing. And the evidence was, the expert evidence was, kissing alone a girl that had in the bathroom done this is enough to make him test positive the next day. So we decided, was he, was Richard Gasquet is his name, was he negligent in kissing this girl? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I'm, I continue to be convinced that Gasquet <laughs> was innocent. Well, thank you very much for uh, that extremely good example of the uh, depth to which international tribunals are capable of going when it comes to <laughs> technical expertise on, on questions that are central to the case. Any other questions? One in the front row. Thank you, Kate Parlett from 20 Essex Street. I wanted to ask the panel um, a bit more about the IBA rules on the taking of evidence, um, because these are now, I think, in commercial arbitration, in investment arbitration, it's extremely common for them to be referred to in the first procedural order um, for the tribunal to take them into account or to use them as guidance. 
Um, and I saw that they flashed up on the screen for the Court of Arbitration for Sports, although given what you've told us, I'm not sure whether th anything's strictly applied there, um, but perhaps they are. Um, I, I, I see the IBA rules as potentially a tool for cross-fertilisation into the other areas of international law that we're talking about today, and I know that in some interstate cases, they've been referred to by the parties that that the court or the tribunal has been encouraged to take them into account. And I wondered whether you had any comments about that as a tool for the sort of objectives that we're talking about in sort of similarity across fora of rules of evidence. Let's go down the line on that, Roman, first. Yeah, uh, I'm a bit biased because I'm about to complete my commentary on the IBA rules, which you will probably see next year, published by the York Oxford University Press. Um, so I believe it's an extremely good I instrument and uh, it's very balanced. It's a good uh, kind of balance between civil law and common law approaches, and they're also flexible enough to be adapted to any sort of arbitral proceedings. Uh, the IBA recently conducted a research where they found that, uh, that IBA rules, one way or another, were applied in 67% of all arbitral cases, 67% uh, of all arbitral cases. What is interesting, the rule which you mentioned from Article 2 about preliminary determination of the issues is the least uh, uh, applied. Uh, it's only applied, if I'm not mistaken, in 2% of all cases. Uh, for some reason, the tribunals are not keen on, on using the, the special, uh, that's actually, that rule was specifically introduced. In the 1999 rules, there was only one provision in the preamble, which effectively said what you quoted. Now it's a full-blown Article 2, which kind of, uh, uh, which is called preliminary determination, and uh, so I believe it's an, an extremely good uh, 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 set of principles, and uh, I think it's it's, it's transportable. Uh, there is there was a debate recently whether we need to amend the IB rules, and the consensus was that uh, uh, they good as they are, we shouldn't touch them, we shouldn't really kind of, um, and. There is one point you've mentioned that tribunals often apply them as guidance, not as binding set of principles, uh, uh, because tribunals want to be flexible. There are parts which are a bit rigid. Uh, for instance, if 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 a witness fails to appeal, the IBA rules say uh, uh, his uh, or her witness evidence shall be excluded, and that's a bit rigid because the LCA rules, for instance, if you compare say, you know, tribunal should take it into account and decide whether or not it's worth excluding, while the IBA rules are rigid and so shall be excluded. Uh, but, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, uh, I, I totally concur with uh, Roman that IBA rules are very helpful as a guidance. Uh, and I gave a lecture uh, uh, some years ago uh, regarding uh, <coughs> Uh, what we can do with respect to some situation that are not really uh, referred to in the IBA rules, for example, examination of witnesses that do not appear, or with respect to privilege or site inspection, I can send you my, uh, my article. Uh, uh, however, I think that these are uh, very good tools and very helpful in international arbitration uh, with respect to rules of evidence, but only as a guidance. Yes. Right. Um, CAS is a Swiss court of arbitration. Uh, you look at the, uh, the applicable law, which is the, the Private International Law Act, PILA. PILA gives you all the flexibility in the world to agree on a specific set of rules. You agree on this type of rule when you accept the court of arbitration for sport. These rules are relatively silent on evidentiary issues. If they are, the court has the, the flexibility to apply whatever in its discretion it finds useful, and what they do is they apply the IBA rules. Unfortunately, um, how should I put this? Uh, there are some arbitrators that lack a little bit of experience and would be um, uh, innocently uh, uh, forgetting about the IBA's rules because simply they are not familiar with those. But it is referred to as the handbook of evidence taking in international arbitration and extremely useful. Watch 
Uh, yes, the same. I think that uh, aspect of the guidance part or discretion of the tribunal is very important. This is more or less what is out there, and as was said, everyone, everyone accepts that, but subject to the discretion of the tribunal. And in fact, this goes also for the agreement of the parties, as, as, as you know. I mean, sometimes the parties agree. In a recent case, I saw, uh, I was uh, surprised, but I saw that both counsel agreed on lots of things. They agreed how to do uh, cross-examination, how to not to do this, how to not to ask for this, and all that. When you leave that flexibility, then that is possible, and that that uh, that can be can can be done. Yes. What is interesting that I haven't found any single case where the IBA rules were used in Russia. Very. <laughs> now, I mean, uh, uh, there was a, an opinion expressed that it it does not sit comfortably with the principle that each uh, party has to prove its case, which I don't understand and I don't agree with. But uh, here we go. When you say Russia, you mean international? I, I, I've checked both the international tribunals and uh, the, the court database, so I haven't found any single case. The court doesn't apply. No, I mean, uh, the courts, uh, the, for instance, the English court applies them when, uh, for instance, uh, there is an application to set an, an award aside and the, with reference to the uh, IBA rules. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've seen Mr. Kolodkin looking at his um, watch, um, which suggests that we should draw things to a close. I've got one last question for Reiner. <laughs> when he says that cross-examination is generally useless, <laughs> is that a general proposition, or does it depend on whether a common lawyer or a civil lawyer is asking the questions? Um, <laughs> uh, I didn't say it's generally useless, but it is in, in many instances doesn't produce a different result. You have a How witness... Uh, you have a witness statement and then the uh, cross-examining attorney, if he's not very experienced, desperately tries to challenge the witness, but unsuccessfully because he's, he's properly um, uh, uh, coached. Now, um, I, I have been exposed to other instances where this was done extremely professionally, in which case it is maybe a very, very helpful tool. But in the, in the cases that I've been involved in, very, very rarely, and I was always, well, except for the first two or three years, uh, sitting on the side of the, of the arbitrators, I was rarely impressed. And I should add that the attorneys at times um, are from England or the US, and they know exactly what they're doing. Very well coached witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> That draws our proceedings to an end, apart from summing up. So I'm not going to... I'm not going to stop the end of this end. This is the task of Mr. Rajputa, which will be able to do it in a minute. I wanted to say that... Мне трудно было представить себе, чтобы наш длинный и насыщенный день мог закончиться лучшей дискуссией, чем та, которую мы только что видели. А слушая ее, я вспомнил, что лет 15-20 тому назад мне предлагали стать арбитром в каком-то создававшемся тогда отечественном спортивном арбитраже. Теперь я понимаю, какую ошибку я совершил, кажется, отказавшись. А, спасибо вам большое. Ани Рудха, пожалуйста. Literary critics may disagree on which is the best contribution of uh, Shakespeare to the English literature, but they pretty much agree on one thing, that one dialogue he uttered is transcendental, which is to be or not to be. I guess that's probably a good way to respond to the question that we've been trying to deliberate for the entire day of 
evidence before international courts and tribunals distinct for our similar approaches to be or not to be, which I think is a step in, in the direction of progress because from a position of saying no, we are at least in a position of reflection, contemplation, should we or should we not. And without sounding like a skilled cross-examination lawyer, which I doubt if I am, who already knows what is the answer he's expecting from a question. But let me sound optimistic at least, but, and that optimism arises from some common takeaways which I thought very well emerged from our discussions that we had today during the day. And it is all because of excellent level of participation from the panelists and from the audience. So I think the real credit of this Shakespearean moment of to be or not to be on evidence really goes to all the participants collectively as a collective thinking exercise. One thing is something on which we all agreed was there are problems. And the problems are at different levels. The problems are across institutions. There are problems within the institutions. But there are problems. Then the question is, if we are looking for similarity at approaches, if the answer is going to be yes, then the question is, at which level we are asking that question? If we are going to ask that question at a very higher level, in terms of two different institutions, the answer is obviously going to be no, because the institutions are different. If we go slightly lower and try to ask, is this a civil law, common law approach, the answer is probably not going to be the same. But if we try to go further down, dig further down into the principles of evidence as they are applied, dehorse the environments in which they are applied, it seems there is a great deal of similarity. When I was listening to the discussion on burden of proof, evidence, shifting of, of burden of proof, especially from the European Court of Human Rights, what came to my mind, that is precisely what the ICJ was trying to do in the genocide cases. Maybe when we are looking at it from a higher level in a, in a, on the top of the mountain, probably we see a bit of clouds and a bit of divergence, but as we try to get closer to it, as we try to get closer to the principles, or just to the notion of the principle itself, we probably can find a lot of similarities. And at least I got that feeling from the discussion that there seems to be a lot of similarity if you're looking at the notion of evidence, the philosophical foundation of a certain principle of evidence. And I'm deliberately avoiding the use of the word rules. Because rules has jurisprudentially or normatively a conception of some binding form. But a principle has great amount of flexibility. It is possible, therefore, that one could conceive of such broad pool of principles to which one can go into, draw upon, and use it based on the circumstances and depending on the peculiarities of that particular court or tribunal. It would depend on the level at which it is functioning, whether it's an institution, whether it is ad hoc. But what appears to emerge is presence of such set of principles gives great deal of clarity. We have seen there have been a lot of debate with civil lawyers, common lawyers. We are, of course, going to keep fighting all the time. The question is, do we want to go on crusade for that? If we do go on crusade for that, the ultimate sufferer is the international adjudicative process. And I, to an extent, really like the approach of the last panel, the commercial arbitrators. Somebody made to me a comment, well, they have to make money, so they have to be practical. But whatever it is, <laughs> they have found a solution. <laughs> if they have a so found a solution, if they feel that civil law and common law can coexist, well, we exist in this, the United Nations, in a sense, coexists. We find common grounds and move on. It seems there is a lot of common ground on which we can form a basis on which we can proceed further. Last two quick comments which I want to make is, we had a lot of references to historic documentation, 1922 circumstances when PCIG was made, references to evidence. Was that a situation when the courts and tribunals conceptualized that there would be a satellite imagery which would be brought for their consideration and they would be asked to say whether they would depend on a satellite imagery? In 1922, did they conceive 
that they would be posing, posed with 20 cross-examinations or an expert witness and how to handle it and how to tackle it. So the absence of principles of evidence in past, was it a deliberate choice or was it not a necessity then? Today when the times have changed, with the changing of the times, is it not a necessity? So the slippage or non-existence of principles of evidence was deliberate or purely accidental. The second point is, while finding these similarity in approaches, what we are talking about, we might use different terminologies. Is it really a difference of terminologies? Because what seems to be there underneath, the undercurrent of it, appears to be pretty, pretty much similar. I don't want to force my views, but I do think there is certain degree of similarity that one can see if one tries to remove the, the theoretical trappings, or let's say the definitional trappings, remove the definitional um, struggle and just try to look at the substance of how those principles are being used and applied. And if we do have such a flexible pool, I think it does add certainly to the process of clarity. If at all this project goes through, this was not really originally the idea at, in the background of this conference, but I, as I was reflecting and I was speaking to some of the existing or the past judges of different courts and tribunals who are bound to feel as this man is on a mission to, to tie our hands, just for their comfort, if at all there is such a project which goes through, the project has to have the notion of principles, the understanding of principles, a set of non-binding norms which courts and tribunals can rely upon, use them effectively in their day-to-day -day adjudication. They are looking at each other because they respect each other. They know each, they, each of them has, has a different expertise. If they are doing it, isn't there a better way to have a more formalized, a more clear, and a more set out set of principles which assists in the overall, overall transaction of adjudication? To conclude, we probably don't want to have a standard of comfortable satisfaction for courts and tribunals which involve a sovereign element. The comfort and satisfaction may be of the institution, may be of the judge, but it is going to start raising question marks in the minds of the users which are states. And states are sensitive entities. There is an element of sovereignty. How that element of sovereignty functions, how it factors in, has to be taken into account. It has to be balanced out also with how individuals are functioning. We certainly don't want to be in a situation where we have principles of evidence being replaced by ex acquired bono, because that creates an equity and a situation of confusion. Clarity will probably help there. But I remember this conversation with a very, uh, very sophisticated German professor, a very deep thinking philosophical professor. I would deliberately not name him, and I think uh, it's not written. I wish he had written those words. But I really like those words which he used in a private conversation once. He said, rules of any kind are disabling for a bad judge and enabling for a good judge. And I think if we try to look at that, which is a very deep thought and principles of evidence can assist in the process, I'm sure it would be a positive contribution toward the, towards the overall exercise of how we look at the international legal system and how we want it to progress in the future. But I must say, uh, I'm just joining everybody as to how phenomenal this whole event has been organized. I'm grateful to Judge Kolotkin. It was his idea to have such kind of an event so that we all could speak to each other. And more than that, I was extremely impressed with the manner in which this whole event was organized. We may have disagreed on anything and everything, but there's one com common denominator on which we all agree, is this was an exceptionally well-organized event and extremely well executed, for which I take this opportunity to thank Judge Kolotkin, the, uh, the Institute, and everybody who has been working behind it to make this a success. Thank you very much. Спасибо, Ани Рудха. Я бы хотел буквально несколько слов сказать. Первое, мы не знаем, мы, я имею в виду центр, не знаем, продолжать ли эту тему. Поэтому уже сейчас хочу вам сказать, я слышу от некоторых коллег, что неплохо было бы 
на Санкт-Петербургском международном юридическом форуме в каком-то формате продолжить этот разговор. Но все-таки мы бы хотели получить фидбэк от участников мероприятия. Если у кого-то из вас найдется время, я имею в виду как аналистов, так и тех, кто в аудитории, если у вас найдется время, напишите нам в центр ваше мнение относительно того, стоит ли нам центру продолжать двигаться вот по направлению evidence, продолжать делать что-то. И мы будем тогда думать об этом, мы будем говорить с теми, естественно, кто спонсирует нашу деятельность. Но нам важен фидбэк. Мы признательны за все хорошие слова, которые были сказаны, но мы знаем, что evidence рассматривается в разных форматах, пишутся книги, исследования, статьи, проводятся мероприятия, поэтому мы должны понять, двигаться ли нам дальше тоже в этом направлении. Это первое. Второе. Я, конечно, хотел бы поблагодарить своих, прежде всего, коллег по центру и тем, кто нам помогал в этом за организацию этого мероприятия, потому что ну, там одно, де, одно дело прийти с какой-то идеей, что-то там сказать, а другое дело по-настоящему организовать все то, что здесь было сегодня, всю подготовку. Я глубоко признателен своим коллегам. Я также хотел бы поблагодарить два российских ведомства. Я хотел бы поблагодарить Министерство юстиции, которое поддержало эту нашу идею и помогло с организацией панели, посвященной региональным а, судам по правам человека. Я хочу сказать, что у нас не только достижения, конечно, но и недоработки. Мы были амбициозны. Мы хотели, чтобы в секции по региональным судам по правам человека принимали участие не только люди из Европейского суда по правам человека и а, и Африканского суда по правам человека и народов. Мы приглашали и Межамериканский суд по правам человека. К сожалению, к нам никто не приехал. Мне очень жаль, но так получилось. Но я в войне признателен нашим коллегам из Африки за то, что они вот сочли возможным участвовать в нашем мероприятии. Спасибо. Я хотел бы поблагодарить также, я уже выражал признательность Российскому арбитражному центру, вот стоит господин Горленко, за помощь в организации последней секции. И я хотел бы поблагодарить лично Бахтия Раисовича Тусмухамедова за то, что он сделал для организации секции по международной уголовной юрисдикции. Собственно говоря, я бы мог сказать, что на этом мы э, заканчиваем, но на самом деле нет, потому что важная часть э, сейчас только начинается. Это небольшой э, прием, на который мы вас всех приглашаем, и там будет возможность еще дополнительно обсудить разные интересующие вас вещи в совсем неформальной обстановке. Спасибо еще раз всем огромное, спасибо панелистам, спасибо модераторам, спасибо всем за интерес нашем мероприятии. И если кто-то жив еще в интернете, наблюдая нас, то спасибо им за потраченное на нас время. Спасибо всем.